we'll launch right in. Um, so not often that we venture into Italian film, but I, I thought this uh, movie reference kind of made itself today. And, and obviously the focus is going to be talking about uh, Omicron. I, I did want to start though, and, and I think this just reflects what Matt um, just presented to us, but we're, we're not in a good place um, in Nebraska and certainly in the Omaha metro area to be absorbing a new more transmissible and potentially more dangerous variant. Um, as you can see that uh, even after our pretty intense plateau that we've been experiencing over the last um, two and a half months since the beginning of September, the last two weeks, we've seen a dramatic increase in our hospitalizations uh, in the Omaha metro area. And I've just taken a habit of uh, updating a, a spreadsheet and graph uh, on just the Omaha metro area just to kind of uh, keep a, a good trend analysis. And, and I, we're all feeling this, obviously, in the Omaha area, but I think it's powerful to see it actually presented in graph form. Uh, we are going in the wrong direction, uh, and we are looking at flu and now potentially a, a new, more dangerous uh, COVID variant, um, you know, and, and essentially have let all of our guards down. So not a good combination. So um, as I, I think everybody who has not been under a rock or in, in the past week has uh, seen um, things over the last several days have taken a, a significant turn uh, in the global pandemic. Uh, most of the alarms started being raised on Thanksgiving Day uh, when most of us were still in our uh, tryptophan-induced uh, postprandial comas. But um, for those who were able to keep track of some of the news uh, and, and tweets that were flying around, uh, there were certainly some concerning pieces of data that were already appearing on, on Thursday. Um, and uh, um, briefings out of the South African uh, public health authorities that uh, some of us uh, did not get to until later in the weekend uh, to, uh, to really go in depth as to what's happening. But, but interesting to, to note that some of the first clusters of uh, this new variant were actually detected in uh, in students uh, in high school and university age students uh, in the Kauteng province of South Africa, which is uh, the most populous province uh, in the country. Um, and a lot of the data that I'm going to present here is uh, directly and shamelessly lifted from presentations that were made by uh, folks from uh, South African public health authorities, and particularly folks from this uh, network for genomic surveillance in South Africa, uh, especially uh, Tulio de la Veria and uh, Richard Lessler, uh, both from uh, the University of uh, KwaZulu Natal, uh, as you see here. And um, worth noting um, that South Africa has um, some of the best uh, genomics and genomic epidemiology folks, uh, certainly in the continent of Africa, and uh, probably as good as anywhere in the world. So. Um, the data that we're getting out of South Africa um, is quite good. And while the overall nationwide public health system there obviously has some shortcomings and faults, uh, the good parts of it are as good or honestly, in some cases, better uh, than what we have. So, um, you know, the, the accuracy of the data that we're getting, uh, I, I, don't, I don't question. This was a, a slide that just talked about the timeline of, of how things unfolded over the last week. Um, Again, uh, these uh, increasing uh, numbers of cases in, in clusters uh, in and around Kauteng uh, were first noted kind of in the middle of the month. Um, uh, and then samples taken really between, I think, the 11th or 12th of November and, and the 16th um, were then sent for sequencing uh, to <coughs> look and see if there were uh, new variants responsible for this. And one of the early clues was actually from one of the reference laboratories called Lancet. This is not the journal, this is actually a reference laboratory <clears throat> uh, in South Africa that noted new S gene target failure uh, in PCR results. Uh, that was not something that they were seeing for a while uh, with the predominance of Delta variant in South Africa. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but if you remember, this was a phenomenon that we saw with the Alpha variant from the UK that allowed us to, to use some PCR assays to identify probable alpha specimens. And that was helpful in the spring of last of this past year uh, in understanding how widespread alpha had become. So 
as you can see, things moved pretty quickly here in uh, early last week. And then by Thursday, uh, the uh, South African health authorities had already identified this new variant that was uh, at that point known by uh, its kind of uh, alphanumeric nomenclature uh, and had alerted the WHO, which very quickly on Friday uh, convened a technical working group uh, to uh, eventually declare this new variant, a variant of concern, and to give it the name of Omicron. Now, one of the uh, early indicators that this was um, not only a different variant, but potentially a very concerning variant were the, the, the suite of mutations that this virus contains. So this, uh, the B11529 is the alphanumeric uh, designation that it was initially given, as you all may remember the, the B117 was the alpha variant out of the UK, B1351 was the beta variant that came out of South Africa again early uh, in this year. So that's uh, a, a common nomenclature, but uh, when the WHO gets a hold of it and names it a variant of concern, it gets its uh, Greek letter. Um, and what you can see here from the mutation profile is, uh, first of all, it has a large number of mutations uh, that are consistent across these viruses compared to uh, other mutants, uh, over 30 mutations. And you can see that 15 of these mutations are concentrated um, in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, which is obviously, uh, if you remember, kind of the most important business end of the spike protein, where it binds to the ACE2 receptor uh, and so changes in conformation in that receptor binding domain can lead to increased enhanced binding. Sometimes it can lead to decreased binding. But uh, in, in the case of some of the mutations that we see here, uh, such as the, the 484 mutation and the 501 mutation, those have been linked in other viruses to be associated with increased binding to the cell receptor, uh, better cell entry and, uh, uh, and higher infectivity. Um, and so <clears throat> you can see here some of those mutation sites uh, pointed out here, the 655, 679, 681 also. Uh, associated with increased binding. And then uh, it also has, as you, if you can see here, the, the 484 mutation. Uh, I think I noted some of these. Yeah, so that's the spike protein genes there. As you can see, the receptor binding domain and receptor binding motif are those smaller boxes there. And you can see this concentration of around 10 mutations uh, right in the most uh, prominent, um, important part of the receptor binding domain. Uh, where it attaches, that's also where neutralizing antibodies uh, happen uh, to bind. And those neutralizing antibodies are thought to be important in how the vaccines uh, create immunity uh, and also are the target for our monoclonal antibodies. So there's concern about uh, vaccine escape and also uh, whether the therapeutic efficacy of our monoclonal antibody products will suffer uh, because of that. Uh, you'll notice here that uh, in addition to the 484 mutation that it has, uh, which was the very concerning mutation that we saw in the previous beta South African variant and the, the P1 or gamma variant that came out of Brazil. Uh, this virus shares that mutation, which is concerning. And it also shares this 501 mutation, which was the mutation in the alpha variant uh, that seemed to give it enhanced transmissibility. Again, that's the, the variant that came out of the UK at the end of last year. It's also the mutation that creates a, a deletion uh, in, uh, uh, of a, an amino acid that creates that S gene target failure. So again, that's where uh, in certain PCR assays that have multiple targets, uh, the target that is uh, PCR of the spike gene uh, will actually not bind to the primer <clears throat> and won't amplify, so you won't get that signal. So you'll get a strong signal from the other target but you'll get uh, no signal or a dropout from the spike target. And that lets you know, or it gives you a pretty good clue that you're dealing with a virus that has this mutation. Now, since Delta wiped out alpha across the globe, we haven't seen very many viruses with that uh, S gene target failure pattern. There are a few sub variants of Delta that have managed to get that. But for the most part, the Delta variant does not have that S gene target failure signature. So. This has been a method that the South Africans have used very quickly to get uh, uh, a good idea of how widespread Omicron is across South Africa. And it is uh, a strategy that hopefully we and other countries will use to rapidly detect the presence of Omicron even before we're able to do uh, whole genome sequencing. Uh, 
So when they did sequencing uh, of this cluster uh, and looked at this new variant, again, B11529, which is the Omicron variant, you can see here that they see this large cluster that pops up all of a sudden, primarily in Hauteng province. But again, that's where they're uh, sequencing the majority of viruses in South Africa, because that is the, the province uh, where the capital in Johannesburg are, and it's the most populous. Um, <clears throat> this is where Hauteng province is. You can see so Pretoria is the capital of South Africa. Johannesburg uh, is uh, <clears throat> the largest city in South Africa. You can also see that the Close by are the countries of Botswana, where some of the earliest specimens were actually derived from, uh, and also Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Lesotho, and uh, what was formerly known as Swaziland, which now, of course, everybody knows is Eswatini, um, much to the chagrin of many map makers. Um, now, South Africa is able to get this sequencing data and to recognize uh, this variant quickly, in part because they sequence more virus than any other country in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, even uh, compared to other countries like Nigeria, which are much, much larger and overall has a much larger gross uh, national product. Uh, South Africa has um, sequenced eight times as many viruses as Nigeria has, even though Nigeria is approximately three to four times the, the population of South Africa. So, uh, South Africa actually does relatively well in terms of how many viruses they are able to sequence. You can see that they still sequence uh, less than 1% of their total viruses, but um, you know that puts them on par with lots of other countries, and to be honest, not too far behind us. As you can see, the U.S. is uh, a little over 3%, and again, that's about what Nebraska has been doing per MATS data. Uh, but the countries that are doing sequencing really well, like the U.K., are sequencing well over 10%. And you can see countries like Iceland and Denmark are sequencing actually about half of the viruses that, uh, that they detect, which obviously gives them much more granular understanding of uh, how the virus is moving and evolving through populations. <laughs> so here is where South Africa stands in terms of their overall COVID pandemic experience. You can see that they've had three major waves since the pandemic began. Uh, the wave that occurred early this year, uh, around when lots of other countries experienced a large wave, was the, the beta virus wave. So if you remember, they had this uh, B1351 or eventually uh, otherwise known as beta variant uh, that had this concerning 484 mutation, which uh, you know, creates difficulty in uh, binding of neutralizing antibodies and, and looked to be a potential uh, problem for vaccine escape. Um, but as it turned out, beta was no match for Delta, and it was quickly overwhelmed in the spring by Delta variant, which then created its own uh, major epidemic wave in South Africa, as it did in most other countries in the world. And really, since the late spring, South Africa has seen exclusively Delta variant transmission, <clears throat> had a large epidemic wave that subsided <clears throat> um, early uh, in the, uh, what is spring for them, September, October is uh, spring season in the uh, Southern hemisphere. Uh, but now, as you can see, South Africa has all of a sudden experienced a dramatic upswing in cases really just over the last 10 days or so. You can see that South Africa has uh, only vaccinated uh, a little over 25% of their population with at least one dose. The percentage of the population, oops, sorry, that's gotten fully vaccinated is, is even lower, I think a little less than 25%. So they are well behind, uh, obviously, many other Western countries in vaccination rates, but unfortunately are well ahead of most other countries in Africa, where I think the uh, overall vaccination percentage for Sub-Saharan Africa is around 6% or so. Now you can see that South Africa has had overall a, a pretty you know hefty experience with COVID-19. They've had about 1,500 deaths per million population. Of course, that's still <clears throat> well behind where we are in the US as uh, we're number one, hooray, uh, 2,400 deaths per million population in uh, COVID-19 uh, over the pandemic. You can see here that um, a couple of concerning trends already that have been noted in South Africa. And this is where uh, really my concern comes from rather than looking specifically at some of the mutations I think we've demonstrated to ourselves now that we're not very good at using mutations alone to predict virus behavior, uh, the effect of vaccine escape and, and all of those other things that ultimately need to bear out epidemiologically. What is concerning, however, though, is you saw that, that large spike that uh, South Africa has seen just over the last couple of days, 
uh, this is translated into models showing that their uh, effective reproductive number, that RE down there, has jumped up considerably now approaching two and, and actually probably higher than that, just based on the, the fact that their modeling still needs to catch up with the data as it's evolving quickly. Also concerning that what we're seeing over the last week, uh, that epidemiological week 47 is, I believe, Thanksgiving week for us. Uh, so the last week that they have full data for, it does look as if their overall hospitalization rate has uh, now gone up uh, considerably. And that's the first time that's happened uh, really for many, many months since the, the peak of the, the Delta wave. And so all of those are, are very concerning trends. All of a sudden they're having this dramatic spike in cases and spike in hospitalizations. And when you start to dig down in that, what's really concerning is this spike seems to be driven entirely by Omicron. So what we're seeing here is a graphic overlaying uh, total cases with uh, the uh, proportion of S gene target failure occurring in those cases, which is that solid line. And you can see that the, the S gene target failure uh, now has exploded <clears throat> over the last a uh, week or so, uh, and is, um, you know, almost all of the viruses that they are detecting by PCR now have this S gene target failure signature, which means they are uh, almost certainly of the Omicron variant lineage uh, bearing that mutation that uh, uh, creates a, a swing and a miss for the S gene uh, PCR. Um, and you can see that it is not just in Hauteng province where they've detected most of the cases and where, uh, you know, to be honest, their public health surveillance is uh, much, much stronger in that province than it is in other areas of the country, which are more rural. But when you look at the PCR testing data from all of the other provinces, not just Hauteng, uh, it's clear that just about everywhere they are seeing this massive jump in S gene target failure. Uh, across most of these other provinces. So it looks as if this is not an isolated cluster just occurring in Hauteng. And, and again, as of two days ago, they'd only technically sequenced uh, about 100 uh, of the total genomes. But what you're seeing now is data from thousands of specimens uh, where they all look as if they are um, uh, the, the Omicron variant. So this giant spike in cases we're seeing in South Africa is all Omicron, which means it is completely taken over from Delta uh, in just the span of a couple of weeks. Uh, so faster than we've seen a virus take over uh, in any other place in the world. Uh, and then it's also true that um, we are now detecting uh, exported cases out of South Africa in multiple countries and, and new cases are popping up, you know, on an hourly basis, to be honest. So this list, which I just pulled um, um, late last night, uh, is, is certainly all uh, out of date now. And, and what this means is just, if this many travelers coming out of South Africa are infected with Omicron, uh, obviously the, the infection is widespread within the country of South Africa, much more widespread than even the data now uh, would tell us. So what should we be doing and, and should we be worried? I, I think obviously the answer about should we be worried is, is yes, this looks to be a much more transmissible virus, uh, or at least it's a very highly transmissible virus it's a new virus and it has uh, lots of mutations that should get us alarmed. Uh, and so what should we be doing? First of all, uh, by far the most important thing we can do to protect ourselves uh, from this new variant is to vaccinate as many people as possible. Now, this also means getting boosters uh, to people who've uh, been vaccinated more than six months ago. And I think, you know, based on the data that show reduced infection and transmission uh, in people who've received boosters, now, I think it should be a priority to boost uh, everybody uh, who's eligible, uh, who has not had a vaccine within the last six months. Uh, and that's to reduce community transmission, not necessarily because it's going to reduce severe disease and hospitalization. We also need to dramatically increase our diagnostic testing, particularly PCR. Certainly it will be helpful if we can use PCR platforms, and, and essentially that's the Thermo Fisher diagnostic uh, assay for PCR that's able to detect that S gene target failure. There are some large national commercial laboratories that use that platform. Uh, lots of other um, hospital laboratories use it as well. So we can start to accumulate those data uh, to get an idea of how widespread that S gene target failure is. That's going to be our earliest clue for how widespread Omicron is uh, and, and where it is in the country. Uh, we, we obviously need to dramatically increase our sequencing efforts as well to, uh, to confirm those S gene target failure 
uh, test results and also to, to get better granularity on uh, where Omicron is located. Probably should start focusing efforts in places that have the highest traffic back and forth between the US and South Africa. So in terms of international flights coming in, uh, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, I believe, are the three cities that have the highest traffic between the U.S. and South Africa. So those are probably the places to start. But the reality is the virus is already in the U.S. Uh, it has probably been introduced on multiple occasions over the last several weeks uh, and similar to where we were back in uh, March of, or February or January of 2020 and <clears throat> where we were uh, in April of this year with uh, new viruses and new variants being introduced, we have long missed the boat. So these um, uh, travel restrictions and uh, uh, border closures for people coming in from South Africa are, are really just for show and are, are probably harmful, <clears throat> to be quite honest. Uh, we also need to make sure that we are, uh, again, going back to things that we know work, like the aggressive posture of non-pharmaceutical interventions, including face masks and social distancing, but emphasizing that uh, testing is hugely important now. Contact tracing will be even more important than obviously isolation and quarantine of people who are positive. And then we need to really ramp up our research efforts to understand what are the, the clinical manifestations of this new variant. Uh, there, there have been some anecdotes from people who seem uh, to think that clinical illness from this uh, variant may be milder. I think it is far too early to tell if that's the case. Uh, as, as I mentioned, many of the early clusters were detected in students, and we know that uh, young adults of that age uh, frequently manifest more mild symptoms than older folks. So I don't think we can say whether or not this virus is uh, similarly virulent, less virulent, or more virulent uh, than Delta. But remember, if you have a choice between a virus that's twice as transmissible or twice as virulent, you always want to choose the virulent one because you'll make up for it in volume with a virus that's twice as transmissible. Um, we also need to, to ramp up vaccination uh, research uh, to understand um, whether the vaccines are going to continue to have uh, good efficacy against this new uh, variant and the effect of boosters in, in improving vaccine-induced immunity. And also, obviously, uh, companies are already looking at new uh, Omicron variant versions of the vaccine if that should become necessary. And, and we also need to look at what's going to be the effect on therapeutics. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, especially because of the mutations in spike protein, but also potentially mutations that may affect the efficacy of the new uh, antiviral drugs uh, that are coming on the market soon from Merck and Pfizer. And finally, uh, obviously, the fact that this uh, arose in uh, a lower middle income country, uh, which has low vaccination rates, uh, and as we know, uh, many low and middle income countries have uh, shockingly low vaccination rates uh, at this point. Uh, we will be vulnerable to these types of events as long as we have widespread virus transmission anywhere in the world. And so it is uh, imperative on us to make sure that these countries not only have access to vaccine, <clears throat> which South Africa actually probably does have access to adequate numbers of doses at this point, they are uh, struggling in distribution and uh, actual administration, uh, which is something that uh, Western countries have not done a very good job of supporting, uh, in addition to not being very generous with our uh, total vaccine supplies early on. Uh, so now the, the issue is how do we make sure that not only do low and middle income countries get access to vaccine, how do we make sure that that vaccine actually gets into the people who need it uh, in a timely fashion? So. That's where we are and uh, should know more information here over the next week or two in terms of uh, how serious this threat is uh, to the US and the rest of the world.